Anytime the Lord is working in a special way, you can know that the enemy will do something to try to distract or to uh, just get the focus on something else. And we've seen some of that going on uh, just even the last few uh, since and during and since uh, week of prayer. And so all that tells us is, is God is wanting to do something special for us. And, and that's a blessing. And we want to let him do it and let him work in spite of the challenges that come our way. And I'd like to have another prayer as we, as we continue. Dear Father in heaven, again, I uh, kneel before you, acknowledging my need of you personally. Lord, you know the challenges that my family has been facing. You know the challenges that we're facing here as a, as a school, as individual students and staff. And I just thank you that you are equal to the task of knowing what's needed and being able to bring us just what we need. And I pray for your special blessing as I share some from your word and a, a story from an individual just the same age as many here. I pray that you would bless and that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, that you would instruct us and help us to understand life and, and real life uh, as it really is and how you relate to all of that for us. So, Lord, bless with your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What do you do? What do you do when it seems like it doesn't work out or you don't get what you asked for? Why is it that they always get what, they get all the breaks? They get uh, the things that seem to, they get the answers to prayer. Why don't I? For once, some might think. You might think that. In fact, I know of some who have talked to me at times, and uh, they haven't said these exact words, but the mindset is there. I've prayed. I've prayed the prayers. I, I've done the right things. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Why doesn't God do something? Some may think. Not always express that way, but it seems like that's what's between the lines. And one of the things, you know, when some think, I, I've, I've heard some young people saying along these lines, you know, why doesn't God do anything for me? I just ask him, just do something. And I have to say this, he has. And he is. I mean, when you think of God the Father emptying out all of heaven, it's like to the last drop in the gift of Jesus. And, and God died for you. Not just someone else. He died for you. He did something for you. He's ever, Jesus is ever living to make intercession for you right now. He's doing something. But sometimes when it doesn't happen the way we expect or the way we want, the way we've prayed, we sometimes check out and say, maybe you're just not there because he didn't do it the way we expected. Some of us grew up with a gross misunderstanding of God and life. Probably all of us have, actually, <laughs> whether you know it or not. When conversion happens, we realize, wait, I, I've been told all those things. Why didn't I get it before? We should have known those things. I've heard that before, but it didn't become internal. It didn't really get bought like we've been talking about in, in, uh, in worships at the dorm. We didn't buy that field that has that treasure. Sometimes we've listened to bedtime stories and got the impression that if you're good, if you're good, everything is going to go well. And if you're bad, <laughs> if you don't obey, oh man, you're going to have some kind of bad thing happen to you. Somehow we get the idea uh, 
that it's almost like a baptized karma. And you always get what you deserve. I'll tell you what, I am so thankful that I have an opportunity to get what I don't deserve. <laughs> that I get an opportunity to not get what I do deserve because what I deserve is eternal death starting right now. But by his mercies, I'm not consumed right now. Sometimes we forget that. It's but for God's mercies that we're even here right now, having an opportunity to listen to something about him. He loves us. You know, this was the mindset of the people in Malta when Paul had had the shipwreck, and then miraculously all of those on the ship come in safely, just like the angel had told them, just like he told the captain. They all came in safely, and now Paul, this older gentleman, preacher, evangelist, missionary, he, he goes and he's helping to put wood on the fire. And what happens? A snake comes out and bites him. And the people on Malta say, ha ha, karma, you must be evil if you got that happening to you when you're trying to help and you were just saved out of that storm. Tuh, you're a bad person. Then, of course, when he didn't die right away, they started saying, you're a god. <laughs> and it did become a, a missionary moment, and God used that for good. Uh, but they had that mindset, that mindset that somehow I can, I can get what I deserve if I'm good enough. And the bad stuff that comes to me is because God's mad at you. And that's why this is happening. I want to tell you unequivocally, unequivocally, that's it, I think. That's nonsense. And it's not biblical. Sometimes things happen just because of the sin, cursed, messed up world that we live in, in this great controversy, war scene that we live in. We all forget sometimes that uh, those faithful disciples... All the faithful disciples, except one, were martyred. That's how their life ended. Except one, and he, they tried to kill, and then he was alone by himself on a little island of Patmos. And there God uses what man meant for bad, a place by himself, to be a place to reveal himself, to reveal Jesus to him, and thus to us through the book of Revelation. We forget that the Apostle Paul, who wrote 14 books in the New Testament, was refused request for healing three times. And God finally told him not to pray about it anymore. Paul, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. It's enough. Even if you don't get what you're praying for right now, I'm enough. I'm enough for you. Personally, because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I can shine best when you're on the lowest place in your life. We forget that John the Baptist was imp imprisoned in a dungeon. And people have wondered about that more than once. John the Baptist, whom Jesus declared there was never one born greater than he. And he died. He was beheaded there. Totally unjust. And Jesus could have made a miracle happen and just opened the doors like he did for Peter. By the way, what happened to Peter eventually? Eventually he was killed. It just prolonged it because he wasn't done with ministry yet. He still had to write a book that I'm going to read some from in just a moment. I asked him to make everything short earlier because I'm going to go over. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> and Elisha, what about him? Elisha, who received a double portion of Elijah's spirit, did not go to heaven in two chariots. chariots. He died after a long, lingering illness, maybe cancer. 
You know, when, when do we usually say, God is so good? When is that? When things perfectly worked out. Everything happened just the way I had hoped it would. God is so good. Yeah, he is. When everything worked out, we passed that test. Yeah, we don't have to take that vocat a class again. We passed that. Or, uh, uh, or, or the medical test, they all, share, they all showed negative. I don't have that dreaded disease. The leprosy is gone. But what do we we say when it shows up malignant or incurable? What do we say when things didn't work out and doesn't go well and we don't get the answer to prayer that we want? What do we say? Do we say, oh, God is so good? Do we? What do we usually do? Do we what? Well, we sometimes do that. Oftentimes, it's just simply silence. Just silence. Or we ask that that three-letter question, why? But it's usually two words, why me? Sometimes we need to ask the question, why not me? After we look at some other things here, I think we will see more of it. Sometimes we forget some of the end of the story that's not the end of the story. Go with me over to Hebrews chapter 11, briefly. Hebrews chapter 11. (coughs) Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith chapter, and you see things happening miraculously, beautiful descriptions of how God has worked in people's lives who trusted him, who judged him faithful, and stuff happened. Good stuff happened, lots of good stuff. And then you see these verses down in 35 and following that say this. Uh, Starts off in 35, the good side, and then it goes down in others. This is the faith chapter. This is the great, the, the greats in God's book. They were... What? Tortured? Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection? The others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned and were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They were They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. He throws in that there. And then says, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Now, I said that's at the end of the chapter. And that's how many of their lives ended. But it's not the end of their lives. Because the resurrection brings something totally different. Where there's no more of the sorrow and pain and sickness and challenges that they had to face at all. You know, one of the early... uh, Do do you know there's a book of the Bible, I've kind of already alluded to it, that... uh, is seen as kind of the Job book of the New Testament. Do you know which one that is? It's the first epistle, first letter, of one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the three that were closest to him. First Peter, yes, First Peter. Uh, it was written around the time of the infamous burning of Rome when Nero had his cronies go and start the fire so he could have fun building again without any regard to his people. Obviously, he was a very corrupt and unjust leader. But it was around this time that Peter, and he hadn't been imprisoned and then eventually killed yet, obviously, (laughs) uh, and he writes this especially to the Christians who were about to or just starting to get into major persecution. And it was totally unjust. In fact, some of the persecution came because Nero was saying, the one who actually started the fire, 
Oh, it was the Christians. Yeah, they're our scapegoat, but never mind. They're the ones that did the fire. They're the ones that made all this happen. So go after them. And they did. And it was these Christians who were about to or starting to have this kind of persecution that God gave this letter of 1 Peter to be written, to be given to these people, to buoy them up, to encourage them when they were facing seemed like unjust, unthinkable, unimaginable, unexcusable persecution and suffering that they were going through. And this letter was written to encourage their hearts. I want to read just the first few verses of 1 Peter and then something in chapter 4. And then I am going to close eventually with a story about a young man about your age, uh, about the student's age. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's go, verses 1 through 7 here. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, these people that were like aliens in their, con in, in their culture, they were Christians that, that were separated from the rest. Scattered through Pontus, <coughs> Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or living, fresh, strong hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How many of you have ever... Well, I better not go there. Never mind. Number Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and f that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And then verse 5, who are kept, and this uh, refers to almost like a, a protected by troops, kept by God, heavenly angels, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That's the deliverance from sin and its consequences. He says, ready to be revealed in the last time or in the final crisis. Wherein, and it's almost like knowing God will have the last word, wherein ye greatly rejoice. This word rejoice is actually, it's like leaping for joy. That's when you're pretty happy, when you're, when you're jumping for joy. Most people anyway. <laughs> Uh, greatly rejoice, though, and here he comes in, though now for a season, for a certain portion of time, uh, uh, how can I say it, a calculated portion of time, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, various kinds of tests, annoyances, problems, disappointments, griefs that are used by the devil to destroy personal faith. Those are the temptations. Various kinds of tests. How many of us experience those kind of things? I don't even have to have you ask, raise your hand. I know. Every single one of us experience these kind of tests, these, these annoyances, these problems, disappointments, and griefs that the devil tries to destroy personal faith with. And then it says in verse 7, that, and you can, you can see it, to the end that, in order that, that is all of these temptations or tests that come our way, that the trial or the genuineness proven in quality of your faith, the genuineness that has been proven of your faith, being much more precious than gold, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So we see here it's talking about for a season we may have these testings, and sometimes it's some pretty tough seasons. But that the trial or the proven quality of our faith that we see through those trials, that he builds in us through those trials, is more precious than gold that perisheth. Then go over with me to chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. 
Beloved, a tender word here, uh, knowing the dark days they would be going through, the dark days that we sometimes have to go through, think it not strange or out of the ordinary concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. You know, one of the things that make, what, what makes heaven happy? What makes them give high fives and rejoicing? What is it? What is it? Seeing somebody gets it, right? They've, they've accepted Jesus. So when we are letting him work through us, through trials, he's actually going to make others see Jesus more clearly through your life and experience. You know, these are the times when people can prove that they're not rice Christians. Do you know what a rice Christian is? If someone's giving out rice, you know, after the church service today, well... Uh, wow, we had a big group in church today, and they all got the rice. But if you didn't have the rice, would they be coming? Hmm. People can prove that they are not rice Christians, that they do not serve God because of what they can get out of him, but they serve him regardless of what happens, knowing that he loves them. And if suffering happens, it's he's suffering with them. This is what real faith is about. Godly people show in their lives throughout history, scripture, and otherwise that we do not find God intervening to, to overrule the bumps and bruises of life. But we find he walks with us. He stays with us. And in most cases, he does not work miracles to change the situation, though he can. And sometimes he sees it best to do so. We have failed to look at this as we should. Listen to this from Desire of Ages in regards to John the Baptist. Not Enoch, who was translated to heaven, not Elijah, who ascended in a chariot of fire, was greater or more honored than John the Baptist, who perished alone in the dungeon. And from Philippians 1.29, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his namesake. And of all the gifts, Desire of Ages goes on to say in, in, in uh, page 225, and of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, fellowship with Christ in his suffering is the most weighty trust and highest honor. You know, we really need to be praying for the people on this planet who today and every day face major persecution. Face major persecution, Fernando, because they're deciding to follow Jesus. Today, they're being stretched apart or, or, or beheaded or, or persecuted in some way just because they want to stand for Jesus. They want to put him first in their life. It is not God's will that people suffer. It wasn't in his original plan. And praise the Lord, it won't be in the new earth either. It tells us no more pain, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more death. None of that. That's his will. But it is God's will to have an honor guard who will continue to love him and trust him regardless of what they're facing right now. In fact, in most cases, he needs them to endure and does not usually intervene with miracles, though he can. And we need to continue asking for those as he sees best. Like the three worthies in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 they say, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, do, do you get it? <laughs> if you don't bow down to that image when that music plays, you're going in one of those. 
And they plainly said in verse 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Because they knew him. And they knew death in that case is not the end. The next chapter is that resurrection by his grace. Or like Job, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I want to close with a story that's going to take a little while of a young man in Seattle about Y2K. You know what Y2K is? You younger ones? That's the year 2000. It's about Travis Allen. This comes, by the way, I, I got someone sent me something very nice here from Morris Vinden, and I'm sharing this story. He tells it. Travis Allen was diagnosed with leukemia 10 months before Thanksgiving. They did the usual, but there was little hope. His classmates in Auburn Adventist Academy began praying for healing. Area churches prayed. Travis was anointed, but nothing changed. Travis became concerned about his eternal destiny, wouldn't you? If you thought, maybe I only have a few months to live. By the way, how long do we actually have? We don't even have all of the rest of today. We have right now. That's all we have. We've had one student going home on break, coming back from break, died on the way here in a car accident. Now, that's not to be fearful of anything. It's just to say, now's the day. That's all I honestly really for sure have. But you'd think about it too if you were in his case, and he was. He was wondering about his eternal destiny. And Morris Vinnan says, uh, our son Lee, who was the pastor of the Academy of Church, shared... Uh, with Travis, the good news of eternal destiny is based not on our behavior, but on what Jesus has done and our continuing acceptance of him. Travis thrilled uh, to this good news and stopped looking at himself. He looked at Jesus instead and rejoiced, but his health continued to decline. Our grandson, Chris, was, his, was uh, best friends with Travis on one of his visits, Travis said to him, Chris, we've been best friends ever since fifth grade. I want you to promise me something. What do you think he was going to ask him? Promise that you'll meet me in heaven. Because I want to hang out with you there. A stronger call, Morris says, than Chris's grandpa ever gave. Chris promised. <laughs> Several weeks later, while visiting Travis, Lee asked him, Have your thoughts changed much since you've been sick? Yes, Travis answered. I used to think that m the most... Oh, wait, let's see. Oh, let me say this right. I used to think it was most important to have fun, to get things, and to be cool. Now I'm convinced that there is only one thing that is important, to know Jesus. It's amazing what being sick and facing death can help you do in prioritizing and seeing what the real score is in life. However, in spite of having peace about his eternal destiny, he would still sometimes awaken his mother at night, overcome with fear. Mom, I'm scared. I don't want to die at 18. More than once she said to him, Son, if you go to sleep, you wake up right away, the next thing you know, and you look in whose face? In Jesus' face. Can you visualize that? Just think about that, uh, think about that moment when you look into his face, and he looks into your face. Okay, Mom, I feel better. Another thing happened as time passed. Travis would wake up in, at night wondering, why me? It was like a voice pushing him toward discouragement and darkness. One night, the Holy Spirit got through to him with another perspective. Travis found himself thinking, if God needs someone to go through an experience like this and still trust him, 
Why not me? From then on, whenever the big why me question would come to his mind, he would counter it with what? Why not me? One day, very late in his illness, Travis said to Lee, Pastor, I'd like to be anointed again. Lee froze. They'd done this already and nothing had changed. What was, this, what, what was the use of doing it again? But Travis continued, no, no, no. Not, not that I want another anointing to be healed. I'd like another anointing service to celebrate the peace that God has given me. <laughs> Interesting. Scheduling the service was tricky because by now, Travis had, uh, was having times of great pain and unconsciousness. On the appointed day, 200 friends were at the church praying while Travis's parents, Lee and the Academy Bible teacher, went to the hospital for the anointing. Travis was in a coma. But when they began to pray, he sat up. He sat up, his mind perfectly clear. As they prayed, he put his hand on his father's neck and on Lee's neck, Pastor Lee's neck, and rejoiced over the peace and even the joy that God had given him. Isn't it wild how some of the hardest circumstances are the place where we find the best blessing? He found it there. Five doctors came by to share with him what the remaining options were. None were any good. He said, don't do anything special. I am, to, I am going to go to sleep. But I'm going I'm to wake up right away, and I'm going to see Jesus. Now, at the resurrection, mind you. One of the doctors said, I'm glad that concept brings you comfort. Travis answered, doctor, it's not just a concept. It's in your Bible. An oncology social worker came by to, the, to, to help the family face the inevitable. The doctor told her, uh, you're not needed here. I kind of uh, like that part. Uh, they were, uh, there were stronger forces at work. Some began praying that Travis's, uh, Travis, as Travis approached the end, God would do something special, would give him a moment of comfort. Sort of like Stephen looking up and seeing Jesus standing up uh, on his behalf. Not long before Thanksgiving, Travis was able to leave the hospital for several days. On Sunday, Chris, with uh, Travis in a wheelchair, did the mall. Monday morning, Travis woke up and said, I'm not doing good, Dad. You'd better get me back to the hospital. They put him in a car, started to the hospital, they didn't know that he was bleeding to death internally. This process made him feel like he had to stop at a restroom. They stopped at Denny's, and his parents helped him walk in. The receptionist asked if they, had, if they wanted a table, then, uh, are you okay? She showed them to the restroom. It had two stalls. Both doors were open. Nobody was there. Travis's mother stayed outside the door while his father took Travis into the handicap stall. While Tom was trying to help his son, uh, he, noticed the other, uh, he noticed under the partition dress shoes and trousers of, uh, of a dark blue suit. It sort of irritated him because he, had, he would have pre preferred to be alone with his sick son. Travis said, I'm not doing good. I can hardly breathe. Right then, a voice came from the other side of the partition, calling him by name. Somebody over there knew Travis's name. Travis, it's all right. You're going to be okay. Travis said, Dad, you better call 911. I can't breathe. His mother came in trying to help him. Again, the voice came from the other stall. Travis, it's all right. I'm here. 
You're going to be okay. The paramedics arrived within minutes and placed him on a stretcher. At this point, the stranger came out of the other stall, went to the head of the stretcher, and looked into Travis's face. Travis, who had been looking at his mother, was suddenly riveted on the face of this stranger. The paramedics asked, uh, are you his father? No, I, I am his friend. He continued to lean over Travis, reassuring him as they wheeled him out. When they got to the ambulance, Travis was unconscious, and then the stranger was gone. When they compared notes later, none of them, parents nor paramedics, had seen the stranger's face. They went and asked the receptionist if, receptionist, receptionist if she had seen a man with a blue silk suit. The receptionist replied, people in silk suit suits don't go to Denny's. <laughs> Travis, Travis died in his mother's arms at the, in the hospital at 10 o'clock that morning. Just a few minutes later, Travis had asked that they have the service on a Friday and wanted it to end right at sunset. The church was packed. There were classmates from other schools, some from Walla Walla College and even Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. Thirty-four doctors and nurses came from the Children's Hospital as well. Travis's classmates, the Auburn Academy seniors, came down the aisle and filled the, church, uh, the choir loft, leaving one chair in the center vacant with a rose on it. The pastor who had taken notes for months tried to share with the people that Travis, what, what he had said in answer to his questions, including how his thinking had changed. Through Lee, Travis delivered a message to his friends, and that message was, I want to see all of you in heaven. And he said, and if any of you are not there, I'm going to be bummed. They had hoped and prayed for a revival on that campus. They did not know that it would come in that way. 1 Peter 4 12 and 13, I want to read that again as we close. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, and you are loved by God. Even when things don't go the way you would like, the way you think they should, the way you'd prefer. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. It's not if, but when you personally will face fiery trials. You may already have. Some of you I know have some bad ones recently, in fact. You might be facing them right now. And my, my encouragement to you now is to trust his heart, God's heart, as revealed in his word when you cannot see his hands at work. Trust him when you can't see it. How many of you want to say, Jesus, I want to trust you. I trust you. Help me to trust you in those times when I can't see your hand. How many want to say that? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, dear Father in heaven, as we read that story of Travis there, it is, it hits home. It makes us think about life. It makes us think about our life and how we are with you as well. And Lord, I just thank you that you are a God that is not just a political friend who is 
feels like you have to do what we ask because if you don't, then we won't like you or anything like that. But, but you are loving and good enough to even say no to some of our even good requests because you see something higher and something better that you want to do for us. Lord, I know that your first plan was not at all any suffering or any death. But I thank you that you are able, even through those circumstances that are by your grace only temporary, that at the resurrection you bring new life and you are able to resurrect us from challenges that we face now and to bring a new focus instead of the why me, why not me, and Lord, what do you want to teach me and show me about your wonderful, loving character? Lord, I pray for each of us. I know that we each either have or will face some pretty significant things in the, in the future, whether it's soon or a little later, but I thank you that always we can trust you that when we can't see your hand, we most certainly can trust your heart and for what you're doing behind the scenes to bring the best for us eventually. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.